Well, welcome everyone, and uh, we're so glad that you're joining us uh, th this evening on the webinar with AFJ. We're very pleased and, and proud to be a part of the wonderful work they're doing. And uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about um, hoof nutrition, food for thought. Um, maybe just tell you quickly a little bit about Dr. Myers. Um, he's a very established veterinarian, um, and one of his many talents is uh, he works on international consults. Um, he recovers very, di very, very difficult hoof pathology cases for horses and I have been mentoring and coached by Dr. Myers for oh a little over 10 years now and very very humbled that I have the opportunity to review such a, a large library of pathological hooves. Um, I believe the last count Dr. Myers database uh, I think believe it contained over about 12,000 radiographs over the last five months so I think we're in very good hands. Um, Dr. Myers and myself have been working together developing nutritional programs for horses um, particularly with problem, problem feet and also metabolic horses. Um, myself about 10 years and Dr. Myers probably closer to 35 years. Sorry Dr. Myers for dating you but experience is really a good thing. So what we found is that nutrition really is key and to help all of us hoof care professionals, um, I think nutrition gives us the means to do the best work we possibly can by promoting a strong healthy hoof capsule with good sole depth and an increased rate of hoof growth uh, which really gives us a lot of hoof to work with. We all know it's very frustrating to try and recover hooves with forward dished, flared, shelly feet, thin soles, crushed heels. Um, making any kind of headway is really frustrating, especially when you're constantly running out of hoof to work with. And without enough hoof, we make corrections directly. Um, we start off trying to, to correct the trim, and, but really we end up relying on shoes or boots, uh, trying to add back the missing mechanics and support. But really in the end, we need to fix the actual hoof if we want to gain some ground. So one of the single most important aids we can provide a horse is offering them nutritionally balanced programs. Uh, the results are really optimal hoof growth, optimal hoof quality, and reduction in lamellar swelling, and white line separation reduction, uh, a lot of these from excess carbohydrates in the diet. And most important, we start to feed muscles and tendons and ligaments to improve muscular development and self-carriage of the horse, which truly helps to reduce the load on the distal limbs. So today, let's just take a look. Um, we're going to try to simplify uh, some very basics of what works well, as simplified as we could, and what maybe doesn't work so well. So you can suggest changes that are going to impact your ability to do quality farrier corrections and maintain those improvements. So we're going to keep things simple and look at five major components of nutrition. And as hoof care professionals and horse owners, let's figure out why we need to look at these five areas and, and what they can accomplish for our horse. Well, Dr. Myers, why is it that protein is so important in the diet? Uh, even though that protein has been sometimes touted as a terrible thing to be feeding horses, particularly they're worried about feeding too much, uh, protein is required to form muscle and tendon structures as well as all the body organs and it also forms a portion of the bones and constantly replacing parts like hair and hoof. It's needed to build enzymes which drive all the chemical reactions in the body. Your heart cannot beat without the enzymes driving the chemical reactions required for this function. So could the horse benefit from increasing the protein intake? Oh, he absolutely can. Um, an excess of protein really isn't necessary, but the correct amount at any certain time is crucial for optimal function performance. The problem is that one cannot be completely sure precisely what that amount may be from day to day or even from moment to moment. Okay, so what kind of protein will give us the good hoof growth and how much do we feed of it, say, to an average 1,100 pound horse? We do have some more research out there and Kentucky Equine Research has determined that two to about two and a quarter pounds of protein per day is needed by the horse in moderate work. And here's the trick and that moderate work is a very relative term. It needs to be remembered that work on the body means that the body is doing something to burn, rebuild, maintain, or repair itself. 
horses needing hoof rehabilitation, fighting disease, healing wounds, and any other processes above base maintenance is work. Laminitis can qualify as really hard work, speaking metabolically. Just because a horse is standing quietly in his stall does not mean his body is free from heavy use from internal stressors. One of the hardest working animals on the planet is a dairy cow. Milk production is hard work and they produce massive amounts, yet they are very stoic. The best source of protein should contain all the protein building blocks a horse needs. Many of these building blocks, called amino acids, can be constructed by the horse to form others. For some cases, however, they cannot. Those that cannot, the essential amino acids, must be provided in the diet or some processes will suffer. If sulfur-containing amino acids are not available, like cysteine or methionine, then hoof growth and repair will be severely limited. Soybeans are the most complete source of essential amino acids produced by plants. Pure soybean meal contains about 44% protein, which is also the most concentrated protein source as well. You know, it's really interesting when you look at this chart. Notice how nutritionally complete soybean is with the red highlighted values showing the highest yield of each amino acid. There's a difference between full fat soybean, which is the entire bean and its contents, and other available forms such as soya meal, which has varying amounts of the fat portion removed. So not to be confused with soya isolates, which is the byproduct that people talk about with big concern in the food industry. So if your horse can utilize the extra calories, full fat soybeans are a truly amazing whole food. Soya meal, however, is generally better for the easy keepers because the fat is basically removed to control weight gain. Notice how the protein gets digested very early in the game, in the small intestine, or also called the foregut, not in the large intestine. So you can see why the easier digestible forms of protein would be more useful since you only have about maybe two, three hours for complete digestion of protein between the time you intake it into the body and passing it out of the small intestine into the large. So that's where you really start to see some major hoof quality improvements. Feeding the better quality forms of protein that get utilized, get absorbed really, really, really well by the body up front. So why then do we need vitamins, minerals, and essential amino acids? How do they fit into the picture and really what's the skinny on them? Well, proteins are constructed of smaller portions called amino acids as we mentioned earlier and named a few. Uh, these protein building blocks give each protein its individuality that allows it to perform different functions and to construct different parts of the body. Many amino acids can be made by the horse but a few cannot. The ones that cannot are called the essential amino acids. The two main ones in the horse are lysine and threonine. The sulfur containing amino acids, cysteine and methionine, are not easy to construct and should be present, although there are more sources of these than the lysine and threonine. Once all the nutrients are available, the body needs to know what to do with them. Vitamins and minerals act as messengers in a sense, frequently attaching to proteins and carbohydrates to assist in their chemical reactions or absorption. Vitamins also play a role on a larger scale to maintain the integrity of tissues such as skin, mucous membranes, blood formation, and much, much more. You can't afford to try to cut out, cut out one of the nutrient groups in favor of another since they, they need all of the nutrient mix in place for the horse to function optimally. Well, then what about protein in hay? Does any of that protein get broken down in the small intestine or does it all get pushed to the hind gut? Well, hays contain varying amounts of protein and they also do not contain all of the varieties of amino acids that soybean and some of your other protein supplements do. Um, but they're also composed of cellulose. That's an external support structure of the cell that has greatly diminished digestibility. Many studies have been done on the protein digestibility in hay and is extremely diverse in the results. Some poor quality hays release no protein during digestion and 60% is about the maximum that has been found to be available from even the higher quality legume hays. It must be remembered that hay does not contain all the essential amino acids in good quantities, so more hay must then be consumed to meet requirements. Much of the protein within the hay will find its way to the hind gut where different processes are at play. 
the bacteria of the hindgut are able to break down the hay and utilize the protein that is contained. But the bacterial proteins and any proteins they release are very poorly absorbed in the hindgut. There are no digestive enzymes in the hindgut, nor transport systems to bring proteins into the body. Uh, okay, you know, I think we need to look at a cow, and the reason being is we do so much of our hay analysis, and a lot of it's originally been based on the cow. And I think that's going to help us understand where we're going and how it's going to help us to create a, a more healthy foot. Um, looking at this slide, the cow's first stomach, called the rumen, is front end loaded with bacteria very different from the horse. And these bacteria in the stomach break down the proteins and even make proteins from other sources like nitrogen and urea. So then when they reach the small intestine, enzymes can complete the process and absorb the amino acids into the bloodstream. It's a little bit different with horses. In the case of a horse, the stomach contains hydro sorry, hydrochloric acid and a few other things, but does not contain any notable levels of bacteria to break down the locked up forms of protein that are found inside the plant cellulose. So whatever manages to be synthesized completes the digestion in the small intestine and then absorbed into the bloodstream, but it's not a whole lot. You can see how much uh, most of the hay protein gets pushed along into the hind gut. So when you receive a hay analysis with, say, 8% protein level for hay, while a cow can easily utilize that full 8% protein, the horse will lose a great deal of opportunity to digest it. So you can make a pretty educated guess that a much smaller percentage of protein is actually making it to the body and why that's so important for farriers, for trimmers. We need that protein to feed muscles and tendons and ligaments to feed bones and organs and to definitely feed the hoof structure. And this is where we personally see a huge difference when we get our nutrition turned around, we get our feet turned around. It would also stand to reason then that a lot of our pastured horses on grass and free access hay tend to over consume in volume because they're trying to make up the shortfall in protein requirements each day. And in the process, they end up ingesting huge amounts of sugars. Uh, a lot of WSCs um, due to the sheer volume of intake. So it's estimated that a horse on free access grazing intakes approximately two kilograms of sugar per day. You can see where this is going with hoof health. Now there's a red flag for all of us hoof care professionals. When you see laminitic rings or dishes and flares or thin flat soles, it may be a very good time to work with your clients to see what the grazing arrangements are. If the horse is um, dealing with free access hay environment, it's definitely an issue. Um, a way around that, feed really good quality protein sources up front and often the horse will actually reduce his grass and hay consumption on his own. And muzzles are fantastic. They actually reduce consumption up to 60 and sometimes more than 60%. And one thing that definitely doesn't work is restricted access. Because as soon as the horse realizes he'll have limited time out, research has now shown that they can actually speed up their intake and ingest pretty much a full day's quota in as short as two hours of, great, of gorging. So what happens to the undigested hay protein that moves into the hindgut? Well, everybody's pretty aware of the hindgut's population of bacteria. Uh, we've got a lot of probiotics and a lot of information out there that really talk about this. And these bacteria will utilize the nitrogen sources in the hindgut to create the proteins that they need. As mentioned earlier, in cattle, this process occurs in the rumen, which is the beginning of the cow's digestive tract. The bacteria are then passed into the small intestine, and the bacteria are digested for their protein by the cow. This is not possible in the horse, as all the protein digestion sources have been passed after leaving the small intestine, and now the bacteria will pass out of the intestines and leave their nitrogen for the plants in the pasture. In the hindgut, bacteria can utilize cellulose for their purposes. So two considerations come to my mind. Um, as environmentalists, we want to provide very digestible forms of protein and not overload the gut with excess hay so as to reduce waste in the hind gut because it passes the protein out the back end in the form of nitrogen compounds which can, can cause soil issues and eventually go back into the atmosphere. So second, we can also see uh, the job of the hind gut bacteria. 
which we can call microflora, is basically to break down the fiber and sub subsequently release energy stores into the bloodstream, which is needed for cellular activity and athletic activity. So what happens if we give unlimited access to pasture and unlimited access to hay? Um, we are always being told it's important to have them eating constantly since they are browsers to avoid stomach upset. Well, remember how the bacteria function. They break down the cellulose into simpler components. The more hay is delivered to the hind gut, the more carbohydrate levels, the more changes in bacterial population that feed off those carbs and starches. There's a big difference between offering controlled small amounts of hay many times over the course of a day and night compared to free access to all-you-can-eat hay. Overconsumption can indirectly alter the environment of the hindgut so the good bacteria do not function or survive as well. Uh-huh. So can you explain how excess carbohydrate intake can be detrimental for hoof health? Well, really to simplify the, the complex cascade of events, carbohydrate excess causes blood sugar spikes, which are followed by insulin spikes. Repeated insults of this type lead to degrading of the laminar bonds from the insulin rise. The exact mechanism as to how this occurs is still under study, but the link between the two is indisputable. High levels of circulating insulin precipitates laminitis. Okay, right. That would happen when sugars and starches are absorbed in the small intestine, usually from grain sources or grass or hay high in simple sugars, ESCs, and complex sugars, uh, starches, and from lots of sugar treats, I'm sure. So if there is too much starch and sugar in the diet, the insulin levels increase as a response to the higher levels of sugar in the blood. In 2007, Chris Pollitt proved the direct relationship between high levels of insulin and laminitis. So farriers and trimmers, if you begin to see a breakdown of the hoof lamina, if you see white lines stretching or recurring abscessing, if you see sole bruising, thin soles and flares, communicate this with your client. The diet really should be investigated. Also, insulin resistance, a metabolic dysfunction of many horses today, involves increased insulin levels as well. Most times, this is actually resolved by diet changes. So when you see laminitic changes in the hoof, please make your client aware to discuss this with their vet to rule out possible IR as well. Uh, in the case where food sources are simply too high in carbs, what exactly do we do? I mean, how can we change up the diet to make it safer for horses? Well, there are a couple of things that we can use for energy in the horse and one of them is fat. Now, fat is really safest when given in moderation, as are many things. It's really very easily absorbed, and it releases about two and a quarter times more energy per unit volume than carbohydrates. Fat does not cause sugar spikes and levels out the energy intake. Vegetable fats in the form of oils are one form of any, excuse me, energy addition to the ration. Rice bran is another way to get fat into the horse. However, it is slow burn energy, so high fat in the racehorse diet will slow, slow his racing times on the track. Fast burn events do require a measured amount of carbohydrates for best, best performance. There are a number of very high fat feeds on the market today, some as high as 15 or 16 percent. For horses that really need additional calories from a severe nutritional compromise, these can be utilized carefully. Generally, this much, much fat is not necessary for the average horse, and an, another point to consider is that these higher fat feeds have a shorter shelf life, so you should check for rancidity, uh, possibly even ask about the dating on the bag. Protein can be broken down for energy if needed, but this is an inefficient process and results in the production of carbohydrates. Fiber is another energy source that is broken down into carbohydrates slowly, so there is no initial rush of sugar into the bloodstream. The healthy hindgut can provide a lot of energy from good hay. Also, fiber sources like beet pulp and soybean hulls are safe sources of energy and are often used to promote weight gain in recovering horses. Alfalfa cubes are lower in sugar levels compared to hay cubes or grass hays and are so a safer source of feed. And then there's stress. What about stress? Can stress create hoof problems? We know horses under stress produce more cortisol and insulin levels increase in response to circulating cortisol. Well, um, even though this is 
possibly unfortunate, stress is actually a normal response to abnormal situations and is required for survival. However, chronic stress leads to more continuous elevations of cortisol, and the side effects can be devastating. Cortisol causes a state of catabolism, which is a breaking down of protein stores in the body and poor utilizations of proteins in the individual. Elevated cortisol also causes disruption in the laminae integrity of the feet from mechanisms largely unknown. Insulin also tends to rise in stressed horses either from the elevated cortisol or other mechanisms that we are not fully aware of. So keeping on the subject of stress and, and hoof health, there's a lot of talk about lactic acidosis or subclinical lactic acidosis of the hindgut. What is this and does this affect hoof integrity? Well, as the pH basically um, decreases, which is causes an increase in acidity, the normal bacteria may die or be outcompeted by less desirable bacterial strains. Streptococcus bovis is an acid-loving bacteria that can secrete exotoxins. Uh, these are toxins directly released by the bacteria while it's still alive, and these directly impact the laminae. Dying bacteria may release endotoxins from within their cell structures that can also cause laminar degradation. So Dr. Myers, what is your feeling about uh, the use of prebiotics and probiotics to help stabilize the hindgut and prevent lactic acidosis? Well, there are a lot of products out there that are labeled as helpful in maintaining the gut flora. It is difficult to determine which ones are best for two reasons. One is that horses differ in the specific types of bacteria living in their gut, as do humans and all their animals. So there is a degree of difference as to which products will benefit which horse. Secondly, there is very little good research out there to tell us which products work well in most cases. There is a study that notes lactobacillus ruteri is not an optimal additive for hindgut assistance. It is detrimental in the study. Live yeast cells are safer to promote pH stability rather than direct inoculation of bacteria, and the yeast cell has been well researched and documented, documented for its benefits. The challenge is to deliver it to the hind gut alive. Encapsulation techniques and extremely high cell counts in the high billions have made this possible. Interesting. I can see that in our research, um, we turn around an awful lot of horses that really just aren't responding even to nutrition. And when we start to stabilize the hind gut, we get a very, very quick uh, result, which, which is telling us we need a lot more research in this area. Uh, what about young horses? How should we feed young horses to ensure good, healthy hoof formation? Yeah, the, the young horse is a little bit different in feeding the fully adult horse. The proper amounts of good quality protein are an absolute must for the growing horse, as you might imagine. The young horse requires more quality protein per pound of body weight than the adult. Also, the young horse is adding body weight at, at a rapid rate, um, which factors into this equation, equation. Add in adequate energy with proper balance of vitamins and minerals, and you have a formula for success. A very important point in the growth of a young horse is that the growth curve must be smooth. Youngsters gaining weight rapidly frequently have the amount of feed lowered to slow the rate and then raising the ration again as one now has dropped too low. This causes a wavy graph of the growth rate. This is the only specific nutritional event linked to bone development problems in young horses in the research arena. Developmental problems in young horses have not been directly relinked linked to protein or carbohydrates as a specific entity in the diet. So restricting protein is detrimental to the young horse. Protein restriction will not prevent OCD or other developmental problems. Very good advice. How should we feed older horses at the opposite end of the spectrum? How do we maintain good healthy hoof formation? The older horse uh, has a little different problem in that he's begun to actually lose some of his ability to digest feed efficiently. To counterbalance this phenomenon, provide high quality feeds, safer energy sources limited to horse activity and body condition, and easily digested protein sources balanced with good vitamin, mineral, and essential amino acid levels. Increased protein intake is usually beneficial, since it has been found that 80% of horses at 18 years of age or greater 
will have some degree of pituitary gland tumor tissue beginning to form and becoming active. This precipitates Cushing's disease or PPID and raises cortisol levels and insulin levels that can affect hoof integrity. So adequate protein levels for hoof repair and maintaining good muscular condition to support the limbs is very, very important. Okay, that's extremely good advice. Um, as farriers and trimmers, we actually deal with a lot of geriatric horses and we can see the hoof health very much declining over time. But that is recoverable. So the first thing we're all going to jump out is uh, run out and look at the NRC, which is Natural, National Research Council um, rules and regulations and levels for safety. Um, what are your thoughts on feeding programs following NRC recommendations? Well, the NRC does a lot of good work and it constantly reviews data relating to feeding practices and available feedstuffs. They change their recommendations at intervals as more information is accumulated over time. They are very conservative in their recommendations and usually a few years behind the most current research because they are more of a storehouse and review rather than a forward thinking and creation type of, in, type of uh, industry. Basically, if they say this is a minimum amount needed, it is actually under the true minimum amount actually required for good performance. Very interesting. What are your thoughts on feeding supplements? Well, pure supplements are targeted to a specific condition. They also need good general nutrition with their use to work properly. Hoof supplements often seem to work when they may actually be subconsciously assisted by the owner or stable manager. Uh, these people will then feed, feel since they are in need of a supplement, they will upgrade the diet as well, and this diet upgrade will have as much or more effect than the supplement. Hoof supplements may work in cases where there is a limiting amino acid missing. However, if there is any one limiting amino acid missing resulting in poor hoof quality, there may be other restrictions occurring that are not as visible and will have longer term detrimental effects on the hoof and possibly other parts of the horse's body. So what are your thoughts on feeding ration balancers? What, what else would you feed along with it? Well the ration balancers that have come to the forefront I think in recent years and they in my opinion are really the optimal way to feed any horse. They not only provide concentrated nutrition in a small volume they allow a lot of flexibility in creating a diet. With the use of a ration balancer formulation, only an energy source is needed based on the horse's current work, whether it is speed or healing. The ration balancer makes feeding the horse simple and economical. It generally removes any need for additional supplementation, hoof supplement, or otherwise. So take home message to summarize, what really is the entire big picture and take home message? Well, in my years of observing horses and, and working with diets, uh, I've noted that horses use protein intake to modulate their total dry matter intake for survival. I have seen the same horses on higher and lower protein diets in pastures and noted that as their diet quality increased, their grazing went down. They also were seen to consume less hay and to eat more leisurely. If the horse has to eat a large volume of forage to meet protein requirements, he can easily unbalance his total diet. The excess fiber will be broken down into sugars and carbohydrates in the hindgut, and while there may not be any sugar spikes, the total effect will be a fat horse. Excess starch and sugars in the hindgut can shift the microbial population and create subclinical acidosis and subclinical laminitis from toxins entering the bloodstream. Excess body fat is also linked to hoof problems. This is not just due to larger mass on a smaller foundation but also the excess fats produce hormones that begin to cause difficulties in maintaining insulin levels. Feed a thousand pound horse a highly digestible protein source up front. There are various manufacturers that make what are called the ration balancer feeds or sometimes called protein supplements containing around 30 percent protein. They contain all the vitamins, minerals, and essential amino acids the horse requires together with a highly digestible source of protein concentrated and fed at a very low feed rate. Protein is efficiently absorbed in the small intestine, provide plenty of fresh water and fiber and forage fiber source at about one to one and a half percent of the horse's body weight. So a thousand pound horse would probably eat two pounds of a protein ration balancer feed plus 10 to 15 pounds of hay per day. 
For the working horse, you can add in additional energy sources to meet the extra demands. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Myers. That is such good advice. Um, if I may, I'd like to add that um, as healthcare professionals and also as horse owners, we are very close and personal with our horses on a regular basis and we really need to watch for subtle changes in the hoof. The, these changes can tell you a lot of information about the general health of your horse. If you see any kind of red staining either on the hoof wall or sole, in the white line or under the bars, this is not normal. It is a sign of lamellar swelling and damage. It is directly related to nutrition in the majority of the cases. So remember, the horse is an athlete and he needs to be fed like one. A strong body, self-carriage, symmetrical muscle development, it goes a long way to support the lower limbs and takes some load off the hooves. Protein builds the muscles, the tendons, ligaments and bone. If a horse is suffering from hoof imbalances, they may burn twice as much energy as a horse that is sound. So you may need to adjust for higher caloric intake, but use safe forms that don't spike insulin levels and don't cause laminitis. Higher protein intake is very effective for hooves in rehab to ensure good growth rate and good quality hoof grow out. It really is all about balance. Some good common sense and communication and cooperation between parties. So we're going to end this part of the presentation now and we're going to move on to questions. So to start with, we have a, it's a very typical question. Uh, Dr. Myers, maybe you can explain. So many people are worried about feeding protein because they feel it makes the horse hot. Oh, I, I get that all the time. And there's really a very simple way to look at this. Um, if in a great many of you have children, and if you feed your children a steak, do they really get all that crazy? Uh, but if you feed them some nice sugary things and candy bars and such as that, does that wind them up? Um, it's kind of odd to think why that horses are the only mammals or even animals on the planet that have been accused of becoming crazy from consuming protein. Uh, there's kind of a circuitous explanation of how this happened. Uh, in feeding livestock, which many years ago horses, uh, horses were livestock in all states and they are not in Virginia anymore, they're companion animals, but the protein is very important in order for these animals to produce meat, to produce milk, uh, everything that they do uh, cattle, dairy cattle get about a 22% protein ration and they eat a lot of it. Uh, hogs get 18, goats get 17. Feed a goat less than 17% protein, he is not going to produce meat. So the horse many years ago even had protein feeds all the way down to 8% and this really doesn't make any sense that the athletic animal of all of our livestock is the one that gets no protein. Well, here's what happened. The feed companies have all this feed sitting around, protein is the most expensive source, and they need some animal they can feed less protein to. Well, measuring the performance of a horse is very difficult. Measuring the performance of the other livestock, dairy cattle producing milk, hogs producing meat, is very simple. You, the feed store causing the loss of production of a very large production operation will be sued is difficult for anybody to sue from a horse who's running slow because there's too many factors involved. So they fed, as soon as people thought that these horses they got off the track, they were kind of run down, they gave them some grain and they wanted to give them higher protein and the horse just went back to being a racehorse again. So they pulled it away from them, gave them some lesser quality hay and they kind of got run down again and they were quieter and they blamed it on the protein just picked something because that's the first thing on the bag. Interesting. <laughs> um, somebody just asked me <laughs> what EPT stands for and I suppose it's a relatively new term but it's I'm an equine podiatry technologist and I, I work with everything from nutrition to hoof pathology. I think what it makes me different from most is um, I have my farrier and my trimming experience but I'm also looking at pathology, in-depth pathology of the foot 
and using specialized podiatry x-rays and working to make very prescriptions on really difficult pathology so we can turn them around. So um, a new and upcoming thing and I um, hope we see more of us. And question number two. Uh, NRC only lists minimum levels of lysine. How much methionine and trinine do you recommend for a mature 500 kilogram horse in moderate work on a grass hay based diet? To be perfectly honest, I'd have to look that up. <laughs> I do that know, I do know that. Nobody um, might know that. Well, I do know that working with uh, some of the bigger formulators, Purina and so forth, um, and actually the individual can do this, uh, you will see they will quote on a graph, they will show you the minimum requirements and then they will show you what they add above and beyond that because it's well, it's common knowledge that it's just not sufficient enough. What we could do is um, the individual asking could contact us at Equus the Balance Equation at uh, hoovesandhorses.com and we can get that information out to you. Okay, going on to the next question. Can you have an excellent hoof quality even with poor overall nutrition in a horse? I would say no, it, you really can't. Uh, you wouldn't have a good quality of anything with poor overall nutrition in a horse. Um, his hair coat would suffer, his feet would suffer, and his whole g general demeanor and metabolism would suffer. Yeah, and I, I might add something to that, that there are very good quality bred horses that are bred for good hoof quality and sometimes they have better hoof quality than a very poorly genetically um, produced horse with very, very bad feet. But that's kind of comparing apples and oranges. The bottom line is if you looked at that hoof, um, it may look pretty good. But if you have malnutrition, and malnutrition isn't starving the horse, it's simply not receiving the nutrients, you're going to see down the line particularly an increased um, incidence of failure of tendons or basic muscle problems. You're going to have veterinary calls uh, as the horse gets older or as you put them into extreme work, they break down really quickly. I have another good question here. A uh, few, horse, few horse owners are likely to want to go to the expense of analyzing forages. Any guidelines? Um, it's really tough. There are some um, producers that now are doing a little bit of analysis of their forages. If you are buying a lot of hay at any one time, it really would be worth your while to do it. And it really isn't that expensive. Uh, there are some labs out there, depending on your area, uh, that can turn it around pretty quickly for you too. Um, we use one in uh, our area that's Dairy One, and they're not in Virginia, but they are uh, readily available. We can get results back in just a few days, and it's not even most of the time doesn't even cost you fifty dollars. Yeah, the nice thing with with near near infrared is they now have a, a large enough batch lot uh, to basically do an average where a few years ago they didn't have a large enough lot sampling. So now it's really very accurate. We do an awful lot of uh, analysis and I can tell you that we've been double checking between wet chemistry and near and they're pretty bang on now. So they're oh, sometimes $15, $20 for um, near analysis for all your basics. So it's really worth your while. Ah, when feeding supplements, I have seen some of my clients combine the different supplements for one feeding. To me, this does not seem correct in that you are changing the values of the supplements that they could work against one another in blanket feeding, so to speak. So it looks like you're, you're feeding different combinations of different supplements. Yeah, I would really agree with that. The supplements, when they are formulated, are generally formulated to be fed pretty much you know, by themselves. You're not supposed to take four or five different supplements and blend them all together and then feed them to the horse because that's basically a totally reformulated supplement that nobody has even done any work with. Um, there, I've seen people feed three or four different hoof supplements trying to hope that if they throw bunches of them together that then it's going to work better. And I see people feeding a lot of supplements, I will go back and I'll just really look at the feed that they're feeding and 
they'll be buying the least expensive feed they can find anywhere in the vicinity and beyond. And it, that's just kind of silly. If they buy really good feed, they probably wouldn't need any of the supplements. And a couple of feed companies, Purina being one of them, uh, did some math on feeding a variety of supplements to try to make up for poor quality feeds, even using their poor quality feed and the prices. And it was less expensive by far to feed the high-end feeds than it was to feed the low-end feeds with supplements. Now there's a question five, and I know that we had a slide specifically um, speaking to that, but uh, I think it's good to go through it again. Can you specifically recommend some highly digestible protein sources? Well, the, the main one is the soybean meal, and it is the, the premier protein that is found in all your ration balancers. There are others, and there may be areas in the countries and of the world where soybean is not that plentiful. Uh, there are a variety of other beans that are used. Uh, in Australia, they even use peas. These are not going to have <coughs> the same <coughs> excuse me, protein balance as soybean, but they can be utilized if, if you're cautious and mix some of them together. We have cottonseed meal that's pretty good. However, cottonseed meal has to be very specially prepared for a horse to eat it or it will kill him. It contains a toxin called gossipol that has to be removed from the cottonseed meal. So while it's cheap to be fed to cattle, it is not cheap for horses because you have to specifically process it for their use. Right. Uh, here's a good question from a farrier. How would I look at a poor quality hoof and think it might be a poor nutrient or nutrition problem? I would say about 99% of the time if you're looking at a poor quality hoof, the horse has not optimal uh, nutrition. That It's just about goes without saying. Uh, I just recently had a couple of people that I would never have dreamed would change their ration and it set them up. I had taken on these horses uh, and they have been my clients. I've been shoeing them for now years. And I was working on one that I'd been working on the horse for two or three years was actually getting his feet to look pretty good. They started collapsing on me again. And I'm just, and the owner is a veterinarian mm. who works with me. And I just finally had to walk up and ask her, I said, have you changed this horse's feed? And, oh, yeah, you know, we were feeding something else at the bar and all. And, and uh, she's feeding him again, and, and his feet are looking better. But yeah, if, if the feet are collapsing, the feet are, you're getting a lot more folds, flares, bars don't hold up like they used to. You're getting some either poor nutrition or you're getting some sugars added to the diet from some source that it may be unknown. And it's usually in the pasture or in the hay when you're not really finding the sugar source. Right, right. Uh, here's another question as well, and it's talking about when feeding a ration uh, equalizer, I think they're meaning a ration balance feed, mm -hmm. such as grow and win. Is it necessary to prov provide the horse with a salt block? And I can I can speak to that a bit. Uh, I actually have all my horses on grow and win, and uh, it's an exceptionally good product. Uh, I have a salt block that's over five years old. I have two horses, two and a half horses, one miniature donkey, kind of a half a horse, and that block's been sitting there for five years, and they don't use it. However, I would never not put a block out. But the thing is, when you start to get into really balanced nutrition, uh, they generally have good fortification in the feeds. There's always going to be exceptions. And of course, once you start working horse and they start sweating and losing some of their electrolytes, you're going to have to replace that. But generally, as a rule, what I see is when you have very good balanced nutrition, they don't need a whole lot of extra salt, again, unless there's a specific reason for it. mostly work. Okay, how are we doing here for time? We have a few more questions anyways. Uh, let's see, this one looks pretty good. Um, if an older horse's hoof becomes thinner with age, is this why they are subjected to getting abscesses because their hooves are so vulnerable to picking up stones? Um, actually, abscesses is usually not the appropriate term for the drainage tract that, that comes out of the hoof. What is happening is as these hoof capsules tend to deteriorate, they develop flares in various areas. And these flares are like bending your fingernail and pulling it away from the quick. 
they'll do that in various spots around the hoof, pull that loose, and cause a little bit of damage to the laminae. The damaged laminae, some of them will die, they'll start to be replaced, and the old dead ones will liquefy. And that's that really nasty smelling stuff that comes out of there. If you could culture it before it became exposed to the environment, you would find it really doesn't have anything in it. Um, a few, you know, you can make a case that possibly blood-borne bacteria might settle there, but usually these are referred to somewhat inaccurately as sterile abscesses. They are really soft tissue sequestrums that have liquefied and are now being ejected by the body. So that's really where your abscesses are forming. And the, this old horse, you know, just give him some better nutrition, make sure he's not insulin resistant, and check him to make sure he doesn't have Cushing's disease because all those things add together to make his foot fall apart. Right. And we find that uh, feeding these um, Cushing horses in particular with age, we definitely bump up their protein and we get a lot better recovery in the foot. Uh, okay, I think three more. Let's try and see if we can get squeeze them all in because they're all so important. I have clients with whom start and stop hoof supplements. How bad is this for hoof health? Well, it's certainly not good. They, I'm sure they run out and they don't think to go get it. Um, if the horse was really using them, if they needed some of the methionine, if they needed some of the possible lysine that's in some of these hoof supplements, then their hooves are going to deteriorate. And the problem is you're not going to see it tomorrow. You're going to see that down the road. You're going to see some little hoof folds, which are going to form your rings, possibly, if they've really been feeding a lot of it. And it would just be easier if they can get on a really good uh, ration that will supply everything without having to deal with a lot of supplements. As you right. might see, if they did a ration balancer consistently, uh, they wouldn't run out because their horse would sure let them know about that, but the horse doesn't care if you run out of supplements. Yeah. Uh, is it better to feed a few small meals of protein throughout the day, or can it be fed in one portion? Uh, as horses go, smaller, more frequent meals are always better utilized. That's just how horses work. Uh, a single meal a day is generally not a really good idea for a horse. Uh, we don't do that with any livestock. It works mm -hmm. for dogs, but dogs have an entirely different digestive system. But I guess playing the devil's advocate, if you had to feed feed one meal a day, these ration bouncers at least are very low feed rate, about two pounds. It's certainly better than feeding an eight-pound grain diet in one shot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> However, as you said, you know, you want to get the maximum digestion. And the bigger the meal, the faster, you know, the stomach is like a, a, a moving belt, if you will, and uh, basically it speeds up the larger por as larger portions enter and spill into it. So the smaller portion stays in the in the stomach a bit longer. You know the the enzymes, the uh, mostly uh, hydrochloric acid, will help break it down. And then by the time it reaches the small uh, intestines, where the bulk of the enzymatic process is, you know you're going to get much better digestion that way. So smaller is better. Uh, I think we have two more. Very good question here. What would you recommend to feed a horse with acute laminitis, and would this change over time? Um, generally, it's not going to change over time. I, we, we want to make sure that we restrict uh, as sugars, carbohydrates, as much as possible. Safe sources of fiber are used for energy, uh, soybean hulls, beet pulp. And this horse is now in high work. There is probably no harder working horse than a really crashing and burning laminitic animal, and he's going to need protein. The, he's not going to be hurt by protein. It has benefits even beyond just being able to provide building blocks for the horse. They have also discovered that protein will tend to buffer the stomach from acid. So this is something that most people really aren't aware of. But we feed the, the acutely laminitic horse just like we're going to feed him later on down the road. He, we don't restrict him from good nutrition because it will not allow him to heal. Right. And, you know, sometimes people get a little nervous, and we're not talking high-protein diets. We're talking higher protein in comparison to what we generally tend to do, which is low, lower than average required. So really, if you did the math, you're probably looking at close to a 13 to 14 percent protein diet, but all of that is upfront with really digestible protein. Um, last question, which uh, gives us, um, let's see here, a few questions about trace minerals. 
Dr. Myers, which trace minerals do you feel are the most commonly deficient in forage and which ones affect hoof integrity? Now, it's going to depend on where you are. Uh, in the eastern United States, selenium is one of your um, more commonly deficient trace minerals that's, that are in there. Um, now, forages, sort of by default, are deficient in some of the macro minerals like phosphorus. They have more calcium than they have phosphorus. You may, a lot of people worry about iron in the horse's system, and that is extremely rare. So you really don't have to worry very much about horses actually ever becoming iron deficient. Um, they, we do occasionally have some problems in rapidly growing uh, plants with manganese, and magnesium can be low. Um, and horses, horses also need a fair amount of copper and that you might run into in certain areas. So I, I usually, because of the, the vagaries of forage and the fact that our soils over time have gotten a lot worse, we, we as farm, the farmers and people that raise hay do try to replenish everything they can into the soils, but we don't replenish the trace minerals. So you can almost sort of say across the board of where all these plants are raised, the trace minerals are slowly leaching out of those soils. So you're going to wind up with less of them over time. That's such a good point. There were a few people that were asking, you know, where can they go to find out a little bit more about nutrition, um, in particular equine nutrition, and probably the easiest thing is um, give us a shout. Send, a, send us an email at hoovesandhorses.com and we would be very happy to forward on really good information to you or point to you in the right direction because there's so much material out there and it's very difficult to know what to read, what to accept, what to believe. And, you know, once you get on the right path, I think it starts to be becoming very logical, truly help your horse. So I think that concludes all the questions tonight. Um, once again, thank you so much for coming in and joining us, and I really hope it helps your horses. I hope it helps farriers and trimmers so that uh, we all can do a better job for the horse.